Raise your hands towards heaven if you feel led to do so. And let's just, what we sang, let's, that's a prayer that we sang. But now, Holy Spirit, we invite you with this invitation as well. We want you to fill this place, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. We want to be more than a place of teaching, more than a place of fellowship. We want to be more even than a place of prayer, God. We want to be more than a place of missions. Father, we're thankful for the life that you've given us. But more than anything, we want to be your house and your people. We want to be a habitation of you, Lord. We want you to fill this place. So Holy Spirit, come. I just pray, Father, that you would touch hearts in the ways that only you can, Lord. Father, that you would speak the language of each person that's here, Lord. That you would speak directly to the need, Lord. And in so doing so, that you would bring a release. Because God says today that He's releasing some people right now. God says that there are people that you've been sincere. You've been asking the Lord for the release in your spirit. From certain soul ties. From certain desires. Even from, maybe it's even cravings. It might even be, I'm even seeing food. That there, there there's that really it's certain things that have become a bondage and you've had a right desire. You've had a right hunger, but yet it's, it's like the cords are still around you even though your heart is free. But the Lord says, I'm cutting the cords today. I'm breaking the chains today. The Lord is still the chain breaker today. And if you'll receive him by faith, he'll set you free today. Oh, Father, we receive you by faith. And we say, yes, Lord. We say, yes, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it in each heart. Do it in each person. And we give you the praise and glory for it because it's your work. Only you can do it. In Jesus' name. Can you say amen? All right. Well, praise the Lord. Are you blessed and highly favored? I already know the answer, but, but it doesn't hurt to say it again. So praise God. Well, uh, let's pray one more time and then we're going to go to the third part of what we're calling resurgent uh, this morning. So Father, in Jesus name, once again, we come before you, Lord, I ask you to empty me and to fill me, Lord, to make me your mouthpiece today, Lord. I pray that I wouldn't miss and I pray that you would uh, open every heart to receive God because you're the bread of heaven that we desire, God. We need you. We don't need wise and persuasive words. We need a touch of the Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that you would do that as, as we teach today, Lord, the lesson, uh, that it would touch us in the depth of our heart and bring the change you desire. In Jesus' name, amen. If anyone else needs sermon notes, there's a few more up here. Philip will get them for you. Anyone else want them? Okay. And uh, if, uh, you have, if you miss somewhere along the way, I do have a master sheet I can give you afterwards too. So we won't have to stop and, and recover that, that ground if you miss just afterwards. I'll give that to you. So what we've been doing for like the last, I don't know, even kind of through the holidays is we've been real practical in, in things because I think we need to get real practical because nothing changes until what? Something changes. And so I've kind of been emphasizing that, but I never want to just become a place that is a bunch of self-improvement because, because self-improvement won't do it, will it? We need the grace of God. And uh, so we're going to, over the next, this is the last one on Resurgent, and we're going to go back uh, the next two to three, maybe four weeks, and we're going to do some more doctrinally type stuff. Next week we're going to talk about the blood of Jesus, and then there's going to be a couple weeks on the Holy Spirit, unless, of course, God has another plan and changes all that, right? But that, that's my current plan as we have it laid out. And as we do those things, I want to just caution you, though, because... We need good doctrine, but doctrine is dangerous because if you know it but don't practice it, it'll just make you proud. You know, that's what the Word said. The Word said it'll just make you puffed up in your knowledge. How many of you know it's not good enough? You know, I, hey, I'll tell you, this is a tangent, but you might need to hear it, okay? I'll tell you, I, could, I can tell you the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you why I believe and, 
And the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I can tell you why I believe in speaking in tongues. And uh, I can, in a lot of cases, take you to even the chapter and verse, why I believe that, why I believe that's important. But if I don't do it, what, what am I? I'm just a clanging cymbal, a cloud without out rain. So the practice is very important of it. Especially doctrine is important, but if you don't practice it, it's just going to make you proud. Nobody cares what you know. It's about practicing it, right? <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Okay, so today we're talking about uh, Resurgent Part 3, Making It Real. Week number one, we talked about Joshua, how he ended up on the backside of the mountain for 40 years. Really, it was no fault of his own. He was ready to go into the promised land, but he got stuck 40 years waiting because of the decisions of other people. How many of you know sometimes we end up in those places like that? Uh, sometimes it's our fault, but sometimes it's nothing we had to do with it. We just ended up out in the wilderness because of decisions other people made. But rest assured that if you're faithful to God, that God will bring you in in the right season. Last week, we talked uh, about vision and the importance of, of having a vision in, in what we're doing. Without vision, the word says that people perish, right? They cast off all restraint. And uh, when we begin to, to uh, uh, work out that vision, there's an attraction that happens through, through the vision. We're attracted, like and precious faith is attracted together. Okay, and uh, so we talked a little bit about that. And today we're going to come down to getting real practical, making it real, applying the stuff that we've learned about resurgence and coming back. Uh, and uh, a lot of it will go pretty quick because it's kind of common sense. But you got it's. Let me stop. It's not all common sense. I got to watch that because sometimes we say something's common sense if you grew up in the church, but not everybody grew up in the church. Right. Or sometimes uh, people have come from other church backgrounds. And so it's not all common sense, but a lot of it will go pretty quickly. But it's more about doing it than just hearing it. OK, so the word resurgent once again means increasing or reviving after a period of little activity, popularity or occurrence. It's a comeback. It's when you've been down for a while and it's time to come back. It's time to have a resurgence. So uh, uh, as we uh, enter into the study this morning, again, this is all about making it real. So we're going to have some real talk today. I hope that's okay, right? We're not going to play church today. I hope that's, that's all right. We've all said things that we're never going to do again and we didn't mean it. No, maybe you have it, but you've heard somebody, right? That they've said, I'm never going to eat that again. And yet you know that they don't mean it, right? Or I'm never going to go there again. And you know they don't really mean it. Or, or you know, I'm going to change everything. And you know they don't really mean it. But if we don't get real with it, it's just talk. It's just a, an idea. Now, everything starts at the level of idea. That's good. But uh, sometimes... Uh, the problem is, is that we're planting the wrong seed. We can be real. You know, we can diligently do the wrong thing. Did you know that? And you can do it real. You, I don't know about you, but I can do the wrong thing really well. And then I can get frustrated when I don't get the results that, that I want. If I wanted to have a field full of corn and I was planting soybeans in all the fields. And if I was diligent, I worked on the tractors. You know, I, I made sure the fuel was good. And I made sure the chemicals were right. And I'm tilling the soil. And I'm buying the seed. And I'm planting the fields. And I'm just the, the most diligent farmer in the neighborhood. But if I did that and I planted soybeans, what am I going to get? I'm going to get good soybeans because I'm not planting what I say that I want. And a lot of times this is the problem that we run into in life with achieving our goals and with achieving our vision. It's not that we're not doing things diligently. We're just diligently doing the wrong things to get to the place that we say that we want to be. Uh, most of us have uh, at somewhere in the past had uh, uh, interaction with the Gary Chapman books, the five languages of love and so forth. And he talks in those books about just this very thing in a marriage. And, and anyone that's been married for a long time has experienced this. You know, the wife may genuinely fully love her husband. And, you know, maybe she's doing every dish in the house. You know, she's washing the dishes. She's cleaning the house. And she's trying to show her love for her husband. But her husband needs a fishing trip with his wife. And so the more she pushes, the more diligent she is, the more frustrated she gets. Why isn't my husband noticing me? Why isn't he appreciating my work? When one fishing trip with her husband would fix all of that. Now, I'm not just picking on the women because it works both ways around. I've said it before, but there's an old saying. You might have heard it before, but uh, every woman has a dream. 
And that is that her husband will carry her into the bedroom, throw her on the bed on top of the covers, and then go clean the house. (laughs) Every woman has that dream. Okay? (laughs) And sometimes, (laughs) and sometimes, if a guy needs to get what he wants, he just needs to plant the right seed. You know, uh, and it's not that you're not, or that we're not diligently and faithfully doing things, but sometimes we're just diligently and faithfully doing the wrong things. I mean, if, if I'm trying to get abs, then doing push-ups all day isn't going to get me abs. Right? I got a ways to go, but I'll get there. Okay? <laughs> Laugh at me now. You won't be laughing later. Okay? But uh, I will get there. Okay, so, but am I right? I mean, I can do push-ups all day long, and that's good. There's, that's good exercise, nothing wrong with that. But you're not going to get abs doing push-ups, no matter how diligently you do the push-ups all day long. And this is where we got to learn to make adjustments and get real with it. Because sometimes we're talk. We just don't want to get real with it. There's nothing that God can't do in this place. There's nothing that God can't do in our life. But sometimes He's just waiting for us to change up the seed that we're doing a little bit, to change up what we're planting. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, what, before we, you can write, fill in the blank, but before we go there, I want to say something. Uh, okay, first of all, we must develop the right attitude. So we're going to look at uh, uh, some attitude things that we have to work on. And you can go ahead and turn to James 4, 13 through 17. But before you go there, I want you to know that I'm serious about uh, having some goals and uh, getting more diligent about writing down goals and achieving them. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty because it'll just bore you. I'll, I'll have a good time talking about myself, but you'll be bored to death if I just talk about myself. So uh, I want you to know some of the goals. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them out there vocally because when you put them out there, it also uh, help. It, it kind of puts the standard up there, you know, that once you say them, you got to kind of do them. And so this year, by faith, everything I'm saying is by faith. Repeat after me, by faith. I'm believing I'm going to pay my car off this year by faith and have enough money in the bank to get an inexpensive replacement should that need to happen, God forbid. The kids' spring college is going to be paid. I'm still working at my faith for the fall, but the spring college is going to be paid debt-free at Cedarville. Uh, all the way through. We're going to have a two-week summer uh, family vacation once again, completely debt-free. I'm going to begin uh, $500 a month in retirement this year because I'm 47, and i got to start thinking about the back 40 years here, okay? So uh, that's going to start happening. Now, here's one that might stretch it, but I've, I've tinkered with this, mentioning this before. I believe in God that within two years that we're going to move out of the parsonage into another house because we have a ready-made mission base right here if we can get out of the parsonage. That's a huge step. It'll take God all over the place to make something like that that happen. Now, what I want to point out, do you see the, the out of the parsonage in two years goal? That's just a goal. That's not the Ten Commandments graven in stone. But that goal if that's the goal, here's what I got to do. I got to get serious about some of the underpinnings. What are some of the underpinnings? I need to be completely debt free, even though we're setting pretty good. You know, I need to have the, the retirement thing starting to happen. Now, uh, some of the stuff that I'm saying is going to fit other places in the message, but I'm going to go ahead and say it here, uh, even if it fits in several different slots al- along the way. We need to not be afraid of the times that we're living in. Okay, the timeless principles will always work. I think that already in the first week of this new administration, what a mess, God help us. All right. Yeah, I feel that way. And I'm not going to lie about it. But guess what? I don't have a phone to call the president. I'm not a congressman. I'm not a U.S. senator. I have no control over that stuff. You know, the only power that I have is to pray and live by faith my own life. I don't have power over that stuff. It's not going to eat my lunch. And I know if you're putting money in retirement, God forbid if something happens. Well, God forbid if you don't put something in retirement. If you put something away and you only get half of it, that's better than the nothing you'll have if you put nothing away. Are you hearing me? But we got to get real with some of this stuff. We can't change the whole world in a swipe. 
But when we want to get real with achieving our goals, we got to begin doing some of those underpinnings, some of those under steps. Another one of my goals is, uh, I usually kind of do it already, but I want to keep it alive and active and even be more diligent about it, is I want to read one to three chapters of the Bible every day diligently and get something out of it, not just read it, but you know, actually know what I'm reading when I do it. Now, there's a lot of church goals, but we have an elder meeting and all kinds of stuff happening, so I'm not going to get into a lot of church goals, but I have them for this year. Don't worry. Uh, you'll be hearing them, hearing them really soon. Okay, but to do this, we have to develop the right attitude. Go to James chapter 4, 13 through 17 is what we're reading. James 4, 13 to 17. Listen here, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to a certain city and we will stay there for a year. We will do our business there and we'll make a profit. How do you know what will happen tomorrow? For your life is like the morning fog. It's here for a little while and then it's gone. What you ought to say is if it is the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. Otherwise, you will be boasting and bragging, and all such boasting is evil. Anyone who knows the right thing to do, but does not do it, sins. So we need to begin developing the right attitude. This passage that I just read you in James, I would suggest go back, read through it again on your own. It is one of the most taken out of context, manipulated passages in the whole Bible. Because we look at that a lot of times and we say, well, don't make a plan. You know, don't have hopes, don't have dreams, don't have goals because you don't know what tomorrow's going to make. Bring, you know, Pastor Dave, you got fitness goals this year. And what if you sprain your ankle? What if I do sprain my ankle? I, I can't control the future, okay? I can't control the economy of the U.S. government for uh, my financial goals and, and so forth. I don't have control over that. James is not saying to be afraid of the future. Here's what James is saying. He's saying that when we prepare, we must prepare with God. Okay, the word is prepare for your blank if you're filling in. Prepare with God. These guys had a great plan, but they just had a wrong ingredient in it. The wrong ingredient that they had in, in it was self-will instead of God's will. It was a great business plan. I mean, if you read this passage, I mean, literally business leaders in the world use this passage for expanding their business because it's a great business model. But when you replace God's will with self-will, that's a pretty big missing ingredient, pretty big wrong ingredient. And that's where we get into trouble too. You notice that I made you say in the beginning, by faith, because all of the goals that we stated are by faith. There is God empowers us to do them. And as God moves us to do them, we're going we're to believe that God is going to show up. I'm going to work on my attitude and I'm going to prepare with God. Now, if we just put the right ingredients in, which is God's will and asking God to show us, then it makes all the difference in our plans. So there's a story from my family that when I was, before I was born, I'm quite a bit younger than my other siblings. Before I was born, my aunt would babysit my brothers and she was a teenager at that time and she was trying to learn how to bake. And so she baked a beautiful pie and everybody sat down to eat it and it was disgusting and they couldn't eat it because she put salt in instead of sugar. They say it really happened. <laughs> Somehow. Okay, it was before my time, but they always like to tell that story, how my aunt, you know, made, made the salt pie that nobody, that nobody could eat. It all looked good and it all looked the same, but one wrong ingredient can mess up the whole thing. And that's what James is saying here. He's not saying don't have dreams, don't have goals, don't have a vision. That would contradict everything else that the Bible teaches us for him to say that. But he's saying when you do it, uh, prepare with God. Make sure that it's based on God's will, not self-will. Because no matter how strong my self-will, it's not strong enough to uh, accomplish a lot of the things that I desire or a lot of the things that God, God uh, desires for me. He says in verse 15, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live here and we will do this or we will do that. If it's the Lord's will, we will do it. Okay, I want to just uh, read Proverbs 16, 1 through 4 real quick. It says, we make our plans, but God will have the last word. You may think that everything you do is right, but it's the Lord that judges your motives. Ask the Lord to bless your plans, and you will be successful in carrying them out. Everything the Lord has made has its destiny. That's Proverbs 16, 
uh, one through four. So we're asking God to bless these plans, to carry them out. We're preparing with God. Okay, like I said, a lot of this is just, it's more a matter of doing it because a lot of these things we know, but we need to be able to, to actually do them. Another adjustment we're gonna make is that uh, we're going not just to pray, we must not, I'm, we must pray, not presume. The word is presume. We have to pray and not just presume. Now, I've said that many times, but God always brings me back to it. You know, this is the problem with a lot of people have this big 2020 vision, right? It's supposed to be the year of perfect vision. Well, what was the problem? People presumed everything was going to be like it was before. I can't presume that tomorrow is going to be like today. I don't have the power to know that. Okay, uh, I can't presume. I mean, I believe by faith that they will be, but I can't presume that my wife and my kids will be with me tomorrow. I can't presume, you know, that uh, that I'll have my all of my health about me tomorrow. Uh, I can pray about all that stuff, but I can't presume upon it. I can't presume upon it. Uh, and we need to learn to pray, but not presume. Now, when we are praying, you know, we want to pray in faith and we want to believe God for the best things. But we need to realize that really at the end of the day, there, there's a sovereign God and we're, we're in his hands. And we get into a lot of trouble with this when we're, again, trying to work things out with self-will. Because we need to know that sovereign God is in control. God is in control of my destiny. God is in control of, of, of my life. Are you still with me? Okay. I know this is a little more teaching oriented, but, but praise the Lord. Uh, so next, and notice that these are all called adjustments because they're not big sweeping changes. They're adjustments. Uh, okay, we're not going to make an adjustment or a big sweeping change and keep it, but we're going to make adjustments that we can keep. So the next one is we must proactively do what is right. We must proactively do what is right. That means because I'm serious about accomplishing these goals, I'm going to be serious about doing what's right on the front end of a thing because I want, want to accomplish them. Now, if you've noticed, it's a lot easier to kill something in the beginning than it is later down. So if there are things that are pulling us away from what we think God is telling us to do, it's a lot easier to kill that on the front end of it than, than to let it get roots and let it get traction and let it get growth. That's how we get into trouble, right? You know, someone says, hey, I, I got this great deal, this great investment, you need to get in it. And we say, well, in our spirit, we're feeling like, I don't feel right about this, but the guy's my friend, and so he's, I can trust him, and so I get into this investment with this guy, and, and I don't feel right about it. And he says, well, I just need, you know, 10,000, and well, I just, not feeling good about it, but he's my friend, I trust him. The company's proven, the company's always performed well when I look at the statistics, so I'll give him the $10,000. And what, what happens? Before long, you're deep into a thing that you never wanted to be a part of. You know what I like? I like the power to say no. That's as important as the power to say yes, is the power to say no. And uh, we have to just proactively do what's right. Put some of these things uh, to death. James said it in verse 17. He said, if anyone knows the right thing to do, but if he doesn't do it, he sins. And uh, then Proverbs 3, 27 and 28 says, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act. Do not say to your neighbor, come back later and I'll give it to you tomorrow when you have it now with you to give. So again, proactively doing what's right. So there's a story of a Sunday school teacher that was teaching a bunch of uh, kids in her class. And she said to, to him, she said, okay, I want you to tell me what's the difference between sins of commission and sins of omission. And one little boy put his hand right up. He said, no problem, teacher, I got this. He said, sins of commission are the bad things that I do. And sins of omission are the ones that I just haven't figured out how to pull off yet. You see, so sins of commission are the bad things we do, and sins of omission are the things that we haven't done. How many of you know that we can sin by what we do, but we can sin by what we don't do as well? Amen? And here's the thing. If we're serious... Once we start getting some skin in the game and we start getting some traction, it's a lot easier to say no. And it's a lot easier to stay on course when we have a general direction, a basic thing 
that, that, that we're, we're headed, headed for. for. Now, now, by the, the grace, grace of God, God that God, God brings the alignment of things, things that things can come to pass, now, as, as, as the reality of a mission base draws closer over the next several years, guess what's going to happen? The focus is going to kind of narrow in on a lot of that. It's going to be a lot more believable because it's not just going to be talk. And as, it, as the focus begins to narrow in, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, someone might say, I want to speak here. And we might say, oh, man, I love them, but it's just not going to fit with, you know, where, where, we're, where, we're, where we're going. And that, that's just a byproduct of it. We have to proactively do what is right in, in order to bring it, bring it uh, to pass. You know, we can, we can gain strength. George can bring donuts every Sunday morning, and I can eat one of them. And I'm glad for the donuts, but I don't eat two or three anymore. You notice the box isn't half empty anymore when you come on Sunday mornings. I'm just, just playing with you. It never was. I was just kidding. But, you know, it's not saying that you can't have what you want. It's just saying that you're going to be more focused about what you want because you're headed somewhere. You're trying to achieve something, something here. Uh, and it, it, makes, it makes all the difference in the world. Now, I have not gone on a diet, and I'm still eating everything that I want. But I do have to remember my belt nowadays, because I'm getting, I've never weighed myself once. In the, in the midst of this. But as, I, as I'm over, it's been almost two months now, as I've been beginning to see, and I, oh gosh, looking at those sermon videos from two months ago, you guys probably don't notice, but I look at that, I'm like, fat slob up there, man. I'm seeing, you know? And, but but as, as I'm beginning to see the results, it's getting easier and easier. I'm still eating everything I want. You know, we went uh, uh, for pizza yesterday, but guess what? I ate two pieces instead of six pieces. And I'm not kidding. I would eat six pieces more because I like pizza, okay? But, but as, as I'm beginning to see the results and as I'm beginning to see things come into focus, it's a lot easier. I'm not going to, like, not have what I want to eat because I want to eat it. You know, it's not like this isn't, I'm not on a diet anyway. Uh, but, but it's a lot easier to eat two pieces instead of eating a, a bunch of pieces. But this is proactively doing what's right. I know I hung out a long time here, but this is probably the area where a lot of us need some work. It's just stamping it in the beginning, right? In the beginning. And uh, uh, enough said. We'll, we'll go on. Okay, the next thing, uh, that, that was more attitudinal based, like adjusting my attitude up until now. But now we're going to get real with adjusting my actions. And again, a lot of this overlaps. But uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war, war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Okay, so this is getting serious about my actions. I'm going to have to start... Not letting my mind be as loose as my mind used to be. I gotta, because where does it start? It starts with the thought, right? And if I feed the thought, the thought grows. I think we all know that, right? What you feed, it grows. Uh, so when I'm getting serious about my actions, okay, uh, I'm gonna begin to question things. I'm gonna begin to question my negative thinking because my negative thinking is not always. Always right. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. Who can understand it? I can't always trust what I feel. And I think that it's right to acknowledge the possibility for something bad. I think you're just foolish if you don't do that. But I think it's wrong to dwell on the possibility for something wrong. Okay, it's fine if you want to say, here's the worst case scenario, and here's the best case scenario. But then don't get stuck on the worst case scenario. Challenge your negative thinking. It's okay. If, if something really is bad, it's okay that it's bad. And, and we, can, we can acknowledge that. But how often do we just assume, just because the negative voice in our head is chirping at us, uh, you know, we, I can't do it, you know, or, or, or it's beyond my skill or it's beyond my ability or I don't have the stamina or I don't have the 
really challenge that negative thought, challenge that negative thinking, because everybody else got dressed. Uh, well, most people got dressed one leg at a time. Don't tell me how you get dressed. I don't want to know. OK, but most people get dressed one leg at a time. OK, most people have to sit up on the edge of the bed for a minute before they get out of it. There's no difference between you and me. OK, the difference between you and me is attitude and the grace of God. And getting serious about uh, the things we're doing. So even though it's talking about thinking, it's an action. When I find myself in dark thoughts, maybe I'm the only one, but I'll tell you, over this last few weeks, I can sure find myself in some dark thinking. I can see you identify, right? Oh, my goodness. All the foolishness of all the abortion protections repealed and, you know, uh, masses at the borders ready to, to come in. And I don't want to bring you down. I don't want to talk here all day. You can watch the news and find that stuff. I want to tell you the good news today. But I can get really dark in my thoughts and really negative in my thoughts. I got to challenge that because I'm a kingdom citizen. And the last time I read it, my path is getting better. That's what the word says. It's shining brighter and brighter to the full light of day. I don't know what's happening in America, but I know what's happening in my life. It's getting better. And by the way, by the way, if they do pass these God awful stimulus checks. Now, I don't mind stimulus checks coming to the people because the people spend it. It moves the economy. Well, it's all the pork in there, you know, building walls in Romania and, you know, speedboats in Mexico and stuff like that. That's where the pro all the stuff that they pack in it. But I can't control that, okay? And here's what I know, is that I know that I serve a God that works all things out for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes. So while I'm not in favor of crashing the U.S. economy, if they do start mailing out those checks again, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay off my car, I'm going to pay off my kids' college, and God's going to use the darkness in the world to meet the goals that He put in my heart for the kingdom. Are you with me? Yeah. So we got to challenge negative thinking. This can be the best time of our life. This can be the, uh, even if the, the world is falling apart, it can be the best time in our life. Ask yourself, what do I have power to control? If I'm in knots about it, then pray about it. If God, if, now, if, if I have the, you know, the phone number of a senator that I have influence with, call him. But if I don't, pray about it. Give it to God and believe that God's going to bring us out of this good. Uh, he wins in the end. We read it, right? Amen. Okay. I'm going to guard my heart. I will guard my heart. Above all else, Proverbs says, guard your heart for everything flows from it. A wise person is hungry for truth while the fool feeds on trash. And we could go to all kinds of verses in the Bible telling us to guard our heart. It's the wellspring wellspring of life you know that man this is where when when you're young well when you're old too i can't even say when you're young but this is where people we get into trouble you got to guard your heart against things that uh, again the guarding the heart here isn't you know just against adultery this is against things that are going to pull you away from where you're headed we have to guard our heart against that stuff. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good, right? Let's try to think a few steps ahead. Let's try to play out the scenario here. Where is this going to go? If I, follow, if I follow this thing, where is it going to go? And that's where we need to guard our heart because it's easier on the front side to deal with the thing than it is when you get deep into a thing. Enough said. Okay. Next, I will be a lifelong learner. Okay, Proverbs 10, 14 says, the wise person stores up knowledge. And Proverbs 18, 15 says, the mind of a smart person is eager to get knowledge. The wise person listens and learns more. So being a lifelong learner, that's not just about being enrolled in school. That's uh, about, you know, learning, progressing in life. I don't know about you, but I hate being stuck. I absolutely hate being stuck. And I, I, I don't always do good at maintaining this, but I try to recapture wasted time, redeem the time a, a little bit, you know. So Silas and I are watching the Marvel movies. Don't judge me, okay? So we're watching the Marvel movies, and he's loving it. But I'm redeeming some of that time, 
And like, like while we're watching, watching it, I'm like, because nobody's, nobody's there but him and me. And so I'm exercising while I'm watching the movies. Well, again, I don't have time to go to the gym six days a week, but I can do some exercises until I'm tired while we're watching the movies. Not to do that is to make an excuse, right? It's like a two hour long movie. I can spend 20 minutes of it doing something productive. And a lot of times, I'm not saying you have to do this, but now that I'm working off this tablet a lot, a lot of times I got the tablet out and I'm, you know, while I'm watching the movie, I'm with some, some people don't like this multitasking thing very much, but I, you know, I'm doing something kind of productive while we're watching the movie, not deeply productive, but I'm kind of redeeming that time because we've got to find these places to keep learning, to keep expanding ourselves. And every, the Bible's on tape, the Bible's on video, there's uh, YouTube, you know, people have spoken on every, everything's on YouTube, uh, except for, well, I'm going to stop, I'm not going to start. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you know you want me to say it. Everything's on YouTube but the president or the old one. Okay, the old president. Okay, anyway. So uh, just keep being, just keep learning, even if it's a little bit. Keep progressing. Okay, and then this one is probably the most important one. I will renew my mind daily. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Okay, so renewing our mind daily. Things have to be renewed. We're geared to, we, just because I'm positive today doesn't mean I'm going to be positive tomorrow, right? Probably I'm not going to be, unless I renew my mind, unless I renew myself. Just because I'm trusting God today doesn't mean I'm going to trust God tomorrow. You know, just because I knew somebody that was a man of faith six years ago doesn't mean that they're a man of faith today. We have to be renewed in this. We have to renew our mind daily. There's no shortcut in this. Uh, we have to plug in the, the batteries into the charger and renew, renew our mind. Okay? And I will continue to seek out and adjust to God's vision for my life. Okay? Number five is I will continue to seek out and adjust to God's vision for my life. So Acts 2.17, Peter quoting Joel, he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. God has a vision for us. We can adjust to it. I'm sorry to say that sometimes I come late to the party, but it's better to come late than not at all. Right? It's good. Don't put them away yet because you've got to do something else on that paper. Keep, keep your paper out for a minute, if you would. You're not quite done yet. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm 47 now. And I know that there's a mission work that God has for me to do. And while I can't wrap my mind around why it didn't happen a lot sooner than now... I want to adjust to God's vision, okay? There may be course corrections. There may be adjustments that, that have, to, have to be made. The way that I, uh, actually, I'm better, I, I shouldn't say this. Let me say this differently. Um, I feel that I'm now more, I feel that I'm better at writing sermons than preaching them now. And that's been a little bit of a trade-off with this format that we're making. But I'm making that, it doesn't mean I can't, you know, I pray that God's still ministering you and you're getting a lot out of it and all that. But that's a trade-off for a purpose. Because I know there's a work, and I can't quite articulate it to you yet, but there's a work that God's making. I, I may be 47, but I'm going to be a fit specimen that can go to backwoods India, and I can... Uh, have a, a file there called Resurgent, and people can download the file called Resurgent, and they can have sermon notes, and they can have sermon outline, and they can have transcript, and hopefully an audio or video link that they can click on, and they can download that, uh, because it's, it's part of something bigger that God's crafting. Will it, where will all of this go? I don't know the answer, but I once again refuse to be insignificant just because I'm in a small church in a small place. We never know what God's going to do. But here's what happens. When we get serious about this stuff, all of this, whole, this whole list, and I know it's kind of, don't criticize me, I know it's kind of self-help oriented today. I get that. But that's why the undercurrent of all this is faith and grace and trusting in Jesus. Uh, but when we get serious about this stuff, none of us can live an insignificant life. 
Because there's something that if, if we'll do it, as, as, we be, as it begins to happen, there will be an attraction that will, will begin to happen. Now, it's kind of subconscious, and I give God the credit, and I'm not taking the glory for it, but you can notice as things have tightened up on the preaching and on even on my physical health a little bit, look what's happening at the church. The church is tightening up. Folks are coming. And I'm not saying people didn't sit down there and think, well, I'm going to go to the Ithaca because of the way they... But, but it's that whole law of attraction type thing. Do you understand that? That like and precious faith is attracted to like and precious faith. And I brag on this church, even though we're small, all the time. Because I'm telling you, we have... I. Hopefully it'll change soon or sometime. I still have to do the finances along with Dolores. We both do them, so I see the finances. Mom's the word, don't worry. Everybody gets treated the same, and I don't tell anything. But the crazy thing is that like 80% of this church is tithers or more. That never happens anywhere. Show me another place where that happens. Well, what's happening is... is some people don't like the word the law of attraction, but it's like and precious faith being attracted together to accomplish the purpose. And as the purpose becomes more clear, and as God brings it more into focus of what we're doing, watch, you'll see more of it. You'll see more of it. I mean, there's not a lot of fat in this church, and I mean that. I mean, it, it's we not need a lot of things that we need to improve on, but... It, it's pretty streamlined in a lot of ways that other places would actually, I think, be very envious of. Uh, but don't let the secret out because, you know, we want to keep it that way, kind of. But we also want, we want to build the base in a way that we're able to reach out to people and sustain the outreach to people. You know, I mean, we could, we could go out and give 65 boxes of food around Ithaca next week. I bet John would supply it if we wanted to do it. Okay, but how are we going to sustain that? Who's coming to pack them? Who's going to deliver them? How are we going to follow up with the people? We just gave them a box, but there's no other connection with them. So unfortunately, we're going to have to grow into this thing. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying, trying to, to grow into it. But it, as, it, as the vision becomes more clear and as it becomes more focused, like and precious faith is attracted together to, uh, to accomplish the purpose. And that, that's God's doing. Okay. But that's not just for the ministry and for the church. That's for you personally. You need to understand that. That's for you. What is it that you're trying to accomplish in your life? Are you trying to get in shape? Are you trying to get out of debt? Are you hopefully trying to be more spiritually minded? Are you trying to, you know, love your neighbor more? Well, as we follow this these principles, because that's all they are, is timeless principles out of God's word. As we follow them, and as things come more into focus, then what's going to happen is God's going to attract those that help help bring it to pass. Case in point, you know, and a lot of these things are spiritual things. You know, people don't just sit down and say, I want to do something. Okay, case in point, my truck. Okay, I was saying, we're going to pay my truck off last fall. We're going to pay it off. We're using it food distribution, you know, and personally I'm using it, but it does a lot of ministry stuff with my truck. And I believe in God that my truck's going to be paid off. And along with that, I was aggressively, aggressively, aggressively paying off my truck. Uh, but even with all my aggressiveness, it, it wasn't anywhere close to what I was going to need to pay off my truck. And then God brings in unexpected money. And not a year later am I paying off my truck, but a few months later I'm paying off my truck. And I think it was in November, that I think it was maybe October or November, that my truck was paid off. What happened? Okay. As we get serious about this stuff, here's what God wants me to do. And now I, I'm getting rid of the distractions. I'm aggressively paying on the truck. What's God going to do? God's going to say, okay, now it's time for my part. Now it's time for my part. And he, God will never meet us until we start to take the walk of faith, until we start to take the step of faith. You know, it'll never work. God, I just wish you'd get all those Twinkies out of my house. No. If you'll take the step of faith, then God will help you make no provision for the flesh in a way that will... Get the Twinkies out, and that'll that'll reduce. Maybe you're supposed to have a Twinkie ministry and go have them out, hand them out to your neighbors. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> I don't eat Twinkies, but I'll give them to people. That's, anyway, so 
Uh, this is not fitness oriented. The whole point, that's just where I'm at right now. The point to this is not fitness oriented. The point is that these things will work. These are timeless principles of God's word. When we start to implement them, God shows up. We do our best and what happens? God does the rest. Now, I made you keep your paper out because as we close, there's one more thing you have to write on it. I want you to write it. And that's I will trust God's grace. Okay? That's what makes this different than a TED Talk. That statement right there. I will trust God's grace. Because at the end of the day, I'm giving it my best. I'm putting all my effort in it. I'm focusing in. I'm getting serious about doing this stuff. But I'm just a flawed human who messes up a lot. And at the end of the day, I'm just going to trust God's grace. There is a verse, if you want to look it up, otherwise just write it down. And uh, it's Galatians 5.4. Uh, we're going to come back to Galatians here a little bit later on in a couple weeks, I think. So I'm not going to say much on this, but Galatians 5.4, it says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have alienated yourself from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now, here's the message I want you to get in this. We misread that verse a lot. We say, well, they fell from grace. You know, they, they you know, that person, uh, that person is drinking. They fell away from grace. That's not what the verse is saying. Okay, listen to the words. Fall from, did it say fall from law? <laughs> the opposite is what it said. Did it, did it say fall from doing everything right? No, listen, grace is trusting God. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I can't do this on my own. I know that without God's help, it's destined to be a failure. But God, I'm going to trust you. Falling from grace is when we put our confidence in our own ability, when we put our confidence in our own self-will. It brings us back to where we started. Remember the good business plan these guys had? But the problem was that they replaced God's will with self-will. I will do this. I will do this. I will do this. And they weren't speaking in faith. They were speaking out of perhaps their past experiences, out of you know, how capable they thought, thought that they were. And all of that's a recipe for failure, unless we trust God's grace. Unless we realize God's going to compensate for my flaws. God's going to make up for where I come up short. I don't know about you, but I don't want to fall from grace. I'd rather fall from law than fall from grace. You can process that on your own. It's just how it is. Stand if you would as we close. And uh, we're going to pray. And uh, anyone watching online, thank you for watching. We're going to say goodbye to you. And uh, we're going to do uh, one other thing here at, in the church. But God bless you. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you hear this and see this and haven't done so, it's a great time to invite Jesus into your life to be your Savior. Just confess your sins to Him. Ask Him to forgive you. And He'll do just that. Jesus Christ will come live in your heart. And uh, He'll make you into a new creation. Be blessed. And uh, we'll see you later. Anyone watching online. Goodbye.